In this video, we will discuss capacitors. In short, they are also called caps. So before we have seen two kinds of electrical elements. One is the register. And for registers, we have seen that we have Ohm's law applied on them. So V is equal to I times R. So if we have a register, this is the symbol for a register in a schematic diagram. Then if there is a voltage applied across the two points, then we can write the voltage difference as the current flowing through it times the resistance. Okay. And these are bidirectional elements. So even if you switch the direction of the voltage applied, so you could have voltage applied like this, or you could have voltage applied like this. So notice this is a plus, this is a minus, this is a minus, this is a plus. In this case, the current goes this way. In this case, the current goes that way, but the Ohm's law still applies. Um, a second kind of element we have discussed before are the diodes. And diodes are what we call non-ohmic elements. And the reason they are called non-ohmic element, element are because they don't follow Ohm's law. So for diodes, we have to have a certain amount of forward voltage applied before the current is going to flow. So this is the current and that's the forward voltage. And we've seen that, you know, the, the diodes look like cylindrical elements. They are, they are basically, you know, most, they are, um, they are painted in black color. And then there is a white strip, there's a white strip that, in, that denotes the negative. So we have the cathode and we have the anode. This is the negative cathode. We have the negative cathode and we have the positive anode. And the voltage has to be applied in this direction before the current would flow. If you apply the voltage in the opposite direction, the current is not going to flow. So these are unidirectional elements. The capacitors, the capacitors are called secondary electrical energy storage devices. So the reason they're called secondary electrical energy devices as opposed to primary electrical energy storage devices, which are battery, is because you can charge the capacitors and they can supply a, a current temporarily when they're discharged. So their basic construction employs two metal plates, two metal plates. And if these two metal plates are connected via a battery, let's say this way, then this is the positive terminal, this is the negative terminal. And between the two metal plates, let's say we fill in with, uh, with some material that is what is called dielectric. It's called dielectric. And dielectric is basically an insulator. So this could be air, this could be some plastic, it could be glass or anything that does not allow the current to flow. Then the electrons from the negative uh, electrode of the battery are going to travel are going to travel in this direction and they will begin to deposit on this plate that is connected to the negative terminal of the battery. Now this is the positive terminal over here so all the electrons that are on the upper metal plate will want to leave in this direction okay and as a result this plate will become positively charged. Now the current is going to flow through this circuit only externally there will be no flow of the current through the dielectric medium. Even though this plate is now positively charged, this is electrically charged, so you have an electric field established, but there's no way for the electrons to move from the negative plate to the positive plate because of the presence of this dielectric. So after a while, these two plates will be saturated with the charges, and then the current in the external circuit, which is over here, is going to stop flowing. And this would happen until the voltage across the plate is same as the voltage across the battery. So after a while, the voltage across the, the these two plates will also be equal to V. So if this is less than nine volt battery, then after a while, after a certain time period, when the plates have been fully saturated with the charge, the voltage difference across the two plates will also be equal to nine. In this situation, we say that the capacitor is fully charged. Now, the question is how much charge is deposited on these plates uh, that can be determined from this relationship. So Q, which is defined as the charge deposited on the plates is equal to some constant times the voltage applied across it. So C is called the capacitance of this construction of this capacitor. Okay, so the charge deposited is proportional 
to the voltage applied across the plate and the capacitance which is determined by the, the way you construct the capacitor will give you the total charge deposited on the plate. So, now what could this be useful for? So first of all, the symbol for a capacitor is basically the two bars and this is for the non-polar non -polar capacitors. So non-polar capacitors. And then you also have what we call polar capacitors. Now polar capacitors have a curved line and a straight line and the curved line is, is the positive side and the straight line is the negative side. So this is the polar capacitor. Just as we have the diodes which are polar, they have a positive side and a negative side, you also have polar capacitors. Now polar capacitors typically have larger capacity to store the charge and we'll talk about what kind of capacitors are called polar capacitors. But it doesn't matter whether you have non-polar or polar capacitors, their way of using an electrical circuit would be similar. So for example, if let's say I have a battery and I have a capacitor and this is a non-polar capacitor across it, then after a while, when, these, when this capacitor is fully charged, there will be no flow of current, right? So this is the positive charge terminal, this is the negative charge terminal, this would be negatively charged, and this would be positive charge plate. And in between, you have a dielectric. So essentially, there can be no flow of electrons from the negative plate of the capacitor to the positive plate of the, of the capacitor. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a switch here. So I'll introduce a switch here, okay? So when the switch is closed, when the switch is closed, so this is, let's call this S, when S is closed, then the capacitor would be, would be completely charged after a while, okay? Now let me introduce another part of this circuit over here. So first of all, let me draw this to be a little bit bigger. And what I'm going to do is, over here, I will introduce a register and an LED, an LED that's connected like this, okay? So this is the circuit. So when the switch is closed, when the switch is closed, which means it's in this configuration, when the switch is closed, then the capacitor gets charged fully after a while. And when the switch is open, when the switch is open, then the circuit that you have will be basically this. So the circuit you have will be this, the blue circuit. So it goes on like this. And uh, of course, you know, we have this part and we have this part. So let me draw this, uh, you know, separately to just to make it clear. So case one is switch is closed so when the switch is closed we have the voltage here we have the capacitors and this part over here is hanging you know just like that and there is no current flowing through the LED right because the switch is closed this is the switch right over here okay and it's closed too. so let me draw it a separate color that's the switch and it's closed too now when the switch is open when the switch is open so this is closed when the switch is open what happens then so we have the voltage from the battery and now the switch is open and this point gets connected to the other part of the circuit and this is my LED over here and we come down over here and it's connected here and of course we still have this part which is that you have the capacitor let's call it C and then we have this line connected over here right so now in this case of course this there can be no current flowing through you know this part of the circuit right there can be nothing flowing here because this is this part is open the capacitor is fully charged at this instant so capacitor acts as a battery now it can it finds a path to discharge right it finds a path to discharge through this led so the current is going to flow from the positive terminal of the capacitor through the led and it's going to briefly light up the led it's going to briefly light up the LED until the, 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 the charge on the two metal plates is completely dissipated. It's completed is until the capacitor is fully discharged. So after a few seconds of lighting up the LED, you will not have LED you know, blinking again. Uh, you will not have LED lighting up. Now, if you close the switch again, you get back to this configuration and the capacitor could get charged. So now you can imagine, you know, the applications for something like this. Uh, uh, for example, the flash in a digital camera. So the flash typically needs a, a burst of very high, high current. Uh, now batteries, because of their internal chemistry, uh, have large resistance and they cannot supply the kind of current that a flash unit might need. So in that case, the battery could actually charge the capacitor like this. And then the circuit is open and the capacitor could dump all that charge almost instantaneously across the flash, lighting up the flash. So that's one application for a capacitor. 
So, so far we have not differentiated between the non-polar versus polar capacitors. So the non-polar capacitors are pretty popular. Uh, and then you also have the polar capacitors where they have to be hooked, be hooked up in a circuit in the right way. Um, so if you look at this uh, picture over here, this is an example of uh, a non-polar capacitor. This is called a ceramic. It's called a ceramic capacitor. And in your kit, you have a couple of these. These are 0 0.1 microfarad. Uh, capacitor. So that reminds me to tell you the unit of the capacitors is given in farad or simply F. So farad or you know F and usually these are very very small numbers like in micro, pico or nano um, for the reason that will become you know clear to you pretty soon. And on the right hand side you see this particular capacitor. This is actually a polar capacitor. This is a polar capacitor. It could be aluminum type or tantalum type and you will notice that one of the leads of this capacitor is longer than the other one and this one just like LED is a positive side this one is a negative side so if you were hooking up this capacitor in a circuit you know let's say this is a circuit you know here's my 9 volt battery and I want to hook up this capacitor you know which looks like cylindrical element then the longer leg should be on the positive side and the shorter leg should be on the negative side so this is how you would you know hook up this capacitor in the circuit if you flip the orientation your capacitor could basically be damaged completely now most of the time uh, you would need the ceramic capacitors in this class not so much the polar capacitor so you don't have to really worry about the, the the direction of hooking them up in the circuit next question is what are their applications so there are several applications for a capacitor before we talked about the diode we talked about a diode bridge in a wall ward AC to DC adapter, you have uh, you know, at least four diodes set up in a bridge configuration that seek to produce a DC supply, a constant voltage from an AC uh, supply, which, which basically has a sinusoidal function. So convert this into a constant DC volt, and that is usually accomplished by that is usually accomplished by using four diodes in addition with a capacitor. Uh, and that's why if you open a wall wall DC power supply, you will find capacitors as well as diodes inside that. Uh, to get something like this, you do need diodes along with the capacitors. Um, the other applications for a capacitor comes in conjunction with using a motor in a circuit. Now, motors are very noisy devices. And noisy by noise doesn't, doesn't mean acoustic noise, but electrical noise. Because the brush DC motors, they have a commutator and brush arrangement where brush basically is in contact with the commutator constantly and is changing the orientation. As a result, it produces a spark. It produces what we call electrical noise or RF uh, high frequency, you know, RF noise. And that could disturb the sensitive electronics like sensors uh, or even microcontroller in your circuit. So if you attach a capacitor like a small ceramic capacitor 0.1 microfarad uh, in parallel to the terminals of the motor or the casing of the motor and the terminal, you basically you know, reduce the noise in the circuit. So this is not so much to protect the motor, but to protect the sensitive electronics uh, uh, in your circuit. Another reason is when the motor stalls, that's the condition when your robot may get stuck against an obstacle and now it's drawing a large amount of current. Uh, at that moment, uh, um, the microcontroller could basically suffer from a brownout or it could even shut down. So the, having the capacitor uh, in the circuit then provides that buffer to basically smoothen out uh, the, the operation. So those are the possible reasons why you would use a capacitor with a motor. Now what you would do is uh, for your motors that you have in your kit, uh, you will basically, so let's say this is the you know, face of the motor, that's the positive side terminal, this is the negative side terminal. Um, what you would do is you would take your capacitor and you would solder it across the two terminals. Uh, you can also solder another capacitor from the positive side to the casing so you could do that as well and from the negative side to the casing again and that's the most ideal configuration for attaching the cinematic capacitors to the motors so, so we talked about the difference between a primary source of energy like a battery versus um, a capacitor which is basically a secondary source of energy right just for fun let's say we want to find out how big a capacitor we would need to store the charge um, in a 1.5 volt AA battery, alkaline battery, okay? So let's say, so the question is, what is the size in farad of a capacitor needed 
to store charge of a 1.5 volt double a battery okay now if let's say you have a battery of 1.5 volt then we can use this formula which says that q is equal to c times v so the question is what c is if we know the voltage is 5 volt right so c times 1.5 Okay, so what is the charge stored in a 1.5 AA battery? To know that, we have to know what the capacity of the battery is. So let's say the capacity of the battery is uh, 2700 milliamp hour. Okay, so if you take a typical AA battery from Duracell or um, Energizer, you might find that the capacity of the battery is anything from 2000 to 3000 milliamp hour. So what this number is telling you is, so this is the capacity, this is the capacity of the battery. So what this is saying is that if you draw one uh, one amp of current okay if you draw one amp of current so 2700 milliamp hour is equal to 2.7 amp hour right so if you draw one amp of current then that battery would last for 2.7 hours okay now things are never that straightforward in, in reality because the the batteries their capacity could reduce drastically if you draw currents at a very large rate from them so for example if you theoretically speaking you could say that if you draw 2.7 amp of current then it, the battery would last for only one hour but if you go beyond one ampere discharge rate from the battery, you may not actually get 2.7 hours. You might get only one hour. Okay, so it's not a linear relationship. Uh, and that's why when you when you draw current from these kinds of alkaline batteries, you have to make sure that your load or your output device is not drawing current at a very large rate. Otherwise, you could shorten the life of the battery very dramatically. So uh, just for the theoretical purposes, let's say we have a 2700 milliamp hour battery. Um, capacity so what is the charge stored on it well we know that i is defined as dq over dt right so the rate of change of the charge so 2700 milliamp hour is 2.7 amp times hour in seconds would be 3600 seconds right so that's in the that's the total charge in coulomb right because you know this is nothing but i times dt so what is 2.7 times 36 so that comes out to 9720 uh, coulomb okay that's the total charge stored on one AA battery rated for 2700 milliamp power. Now we can plug that into this equation and find out what C would be. So C would be equal to Q divided by 1.5 volt. So that's 9720 divided by 1.5. And that is equal to 6480. Keep in mind that, that this calculation is done uh, assuming that the battery would be discharged at constant 1.5 volt in reality that would never happen okay so this is basically providing a sort of an upper limit of the total charge so let's put things in perspective what is 6480 farad okay now 6480 farad is actually a very large uh, capacitor if you look at some of these electrolytic capacitors uh, you know um, they are not even one farad okay so let's say you had a capacitor uh, of one farad you know how big that would be that might be the size of a soda can and that means that you would need these many soda cans to actually so soda can size capacitors to store the total charge of uh, 1.5 volt AA battery so the capacitors are not very good for storing a large amount of energy right so their energy density is much poorer compared to the energy density of the battery but they can supply energy at a very fast rate at, at a very at a burst that the batteries cannot because batteries have their internal chemistry limiting as to how fast you can supply the current to a device